So we are ready to get started. Thank you very much, Carol for uh, being willing to join us. Carol, I think, is probably familiar to many of us uh, working in infection prevention and control and actually uh, help lead the charge with respect to understanding not only the broader public health and, and what is going on at the, at the state level, but it's been particularly important to us in infection prevention in her role um, at, uh, at KDPH regarding notifiable diseases. So our our reportable diseases, what uh, the definitions are, what our responsibilities are. And we, we frequently get questions about what is reportable, uh, who needs to be doing the reporting, what sort of changes have we had in the regulations. So thank you very much, Carol, for uh, being willing to provide us with this overview. And, um, and as, as mentioned, we will, uh, in our recording this, so, we will make this available on the YouTube channel where we keep all of the going around. So any of you um, in the, the audience or Carol, if you want to share this with other groups, this might make a, a, a nice uh, catch up on where we are with our reportable diseases so we can you know, support our public health, broader public health initiatives. So with that, let me turn it over to you and remind people if you have questions, put them in the chat. And uh, at the end, then we'll go through that and uh, and make sure that we can address uh, those questions while we have our expert with us. Thank you, Dr. Carrico. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. Um, I think, you know, more than ever, it's really important that clinical practice and public health work together. Um, we're kind of two pieces of a larger puzzle. And I, I really appreciate this opportunity so that we can, um, Kind of understand each other's perspectives and and hopefully work together better going forward. So I'm going to provide what I hope is a brief um, and not too dull overview of our reportable diseases in Kentucky. So this is coming from the Kentucky Department for Public Health, um, and our mission is you know prevent, promote, and protect. So that is the lens that we're looking through here. Um, you know, it's not individual case patient care, it is looking at the population and ideally preventing, um, controlling when necessary, but ideally preventing those, those upstream measures. So I wanna go over the objectives a little bit. So basically what this all comes down to is understanding the who, what, why, when, and how of the reportable disease regulation. So what are the requirements for reporting diseases? What are the requirements for outbreaks? And then what information does the local health department really need to know so that they can investigate and report to the state and then in, we in turn report to CDC. Okay, so our reportable disease regulation that we're going to be discussing is 902 KAR 2020, and it is updated um, fairly regularly, especially with all the public health responses we've had. We've had to update it a few times for COVID, and we've also updated it recently for monkeypox. Um, I did put the link on the bottom. That is the best place to go to obtain the most um, up to date. Uh, regulation. It is, you know, a, a legal document, so it is in a bit of legalese with some circular um, language, but um, I'll try to walk through the big points of what's required. Um, so within this regulation, it specifies exactly what diseases and health hazards need to be reported to local and state public health authorities. Um, it, it also sets out the timeline in which we require um, reporting to occur. So urgent urgent conditions require, you know, immediate notification within 24 hours. Um, we have conditions that are required to be reported within one business day and then five business days as well. There's a subsection of the reportable disease regulation that also mandates the submission of isolates and clinical specimens to our division of laboratory services for certain but not all conditions. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then it also mandates the reporting of outbreaks of any communicable disease. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but just an important tidbit that um, all, all outbreaks are reportable, even if the communicable disease, individual cases of that, indiv of that communicable disease are not reportable. And so a great example of that would be norovirus. Um, we don't want to receive individual lab reports of norovirus, but if there is an outbreak, that is reportable. A 
Okay, so I think, you know, big question is why? So why do we want these conditions reported to the public health department? Again, we're not the ones that are caring for the patient. Um, we're not providing treatment, but what we're doing is we're wanting to get a population level view of what's happening in the state as far as communicable diseases go. So with reports, we're able to understand the presence and quantify the burden of communicable diseases in the state. We conduct public health surveillance for these conditions. And if there are clusters and outbreaks occurring, if we can get reports of, you know, the majority of these cases, we're able to detect those clusters and outbreaks. Um, from that, we want to be able to identify the sources or the vectors or the vehicles um, that are spreading those communicable diseases. And then ultimately, we want to implement control measures to stop the spread of the disease and if an outbreak is occurring to stop the outbreak. Um, ideally, you know, we want to understand all those root factors that lead to um, communicable disease cases and outbreaks so that we can implement prevention measures to lower the overall burden of communicable diseases. And so that really is our core public health upstream measures. Um, we really want to implement those prevention measures so that downstream we don't have the burden of communicable diseases. We want to improve overall population health and we want to move that needle. So this is kind of a high level overview of, of the conditions that are in the reportable disease regulation. Um, again, you can refer to the specific regulation to see each and every one. Um, we've got our foodborne, waterborne, and enteric diseases. So these are our classic, you know, salmonella, listeria, um, legionella, vibrio. There are zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. So these are mosquito-borne diseases like malaria, dengue, um, West Nile virus and our tick-borne diseases, so Lyme disease, rickettsial diseases um, would fall under there. Uh, viral hepatitis A, B, and C are reportable, our emerging infectious diseases. And this is kind of where when we have those new and emerging diseases like monkeypox or like Middle East Respiratory Syndrome um, or, or MERS, that's, that's kind of a very broad, vague language that gives us the authority to investigate those types of conditions. So they're not necessarily specifically enumerated, but they are covered under that emerging and re-emerging infectious disease language. Um, we also have the authority to investigate sexually transmitted diseases and HIV AIDS, as well as healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistant organisms, tuberculosis, and then vaccine pre preventable diseases like measles, mumps, and rubella. This is our amended table of reporting requirements. Um, so if you look at the regulation and it's it's pretty dense, it's I think 20 to 30 pages of requirements. This amended table is available on our website and it really distills down the requirements into a more easily digestible format. I know it's probably small on your screen, um, but I really recommend that you go and look at it. It has the conditions listed alphabetically by the reporting requirement timeframe. So the Organisms in the left hand corner are reportable within 24 hours, and these are the conditions that would potentially be an indication of um, a sentinel event. So, for example, if we had a case of possible case of polio, a single case would be a huge deal. Um, and also a lot of these are agents that could possibly be indications of bioterrorism. These are a lot of these are select agents. Um, and then in the middle category are the bulk of our conditions, which are reportable within one business day. Those are all listed there. And then uh, the final column has some specifications for reportable conditions within five business days, and then some additional information about STDs and HIV. This also has a second page, and it walks you through what is reportable um, for the Healthcare Associated Infection Prevention Program, what is reportable by ELR only, and then what is um, what we require specimens to be sent for. So again, I, I really recommend that you refer to this. Um, it, it does make it a little bit easier to understand than the reg. This one, I will say, still needs to be updated. It does not have orthopox added yet, which was just added in the most recent update. Okay, so who receives the reports? This would be the local health department of the patient's county of residence. So not necessarily the residence that the healthcare facility is located in, but the patient's county of residence and or the Kentucky Department for Public Health. Um, 
most almost all of the reportable conditions in that regulation are coordinated by the Division of Epidemiology and Health Planning. The exceptions are things like um, lead, lead, childhood lead levels, which goes to the Maternal and Child Health Program, um, and EVOLI, which is the um, vaping associated lung injury condition that would go to the Tobacco Control Program. But for the most part, it, everything else goes to Division of Epi. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, I know that the state is kind of, you know, this big faceless entity, the state, um, but I just wanted to to kind of show who who within the state gets gets those conditions. Um, so we have our environmental public health tracking program within the division office, and they are taking the lead on some of our environmental hazard conditions. So these would be things like um, carbon monoxide poisoning and asbestosis. Um, they're they're setting up surveillance for that. Our Kentucky immunization branch covers most of the vaccine preventable diseases, um, but reportable diseases covers hepatitis A. So there's a little, um, we overlap a little bit. And then the infectious disease branch is made up of six programs um, listed there, and they cover the rest of the reportable conditions in Kentucky. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, tuberculosis program covers TB, STD prevention and control covers STDs. The viral hepatitis section covers hepatitis, perinatal hepatitis C, and then um, the healthcare associated infection and antimicrobial resistance program covers the majority of healthcare associated infections. Um, the reportable diseases section covers just about everything else. So the foodborne and waterborne conditions, the vector borne conditions, um, most of the emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, and most of the acute viral hepatitises. So the regulation also specifies exactly what you have to report, um, but in general, it's the name and date of birth of the patient, their gender, race, and ethnicity. And here, I just want to highlight that um, we we tend to not in this at, at the state and health department level, we tend to have very poor race and ethnicity data for our pa for our cases. I think um, that was really highlighted during the COVID nineteen outbreak. And this is something that we are really pushing to try to enhance um, because it's, it's very difficult to understand what our health disparities are in the state and what we can do to improve health equity if, if we don't have that race and ethnicity data. Uh, we also need the county of residence of the patient at a minimum so that we know which local health department needs to do the investigation. A patient address is ideal so that we can send a letter if we need to, and then the phone number so that we can call the patient. Um, if an investigation is needed. We also need the name, address, and phone number of the reporting medical provider or the facility. We need to know what condition or conditions are being reported, and then ideally the signs and symptoms, um, the really critical ones. So how to report. So Kentucky is a dual reporting state, and this is also specified in the regulation. So what that means is that both providers and laboratories have a requirement to report to either the local health department or to the Kentucky Department for Public Health. And they do that through a couple of different mechanisms. So laboratories are required to submit the lab reports. Ideally, we want them electronically through our Kentucky Health Information Exchange. If labs cannot submit a lab report via ELR, we also have through our COVID funds, if we've been working to set up a couple of other modalities so that labs can submit. Um, and we have a lab surveillance team who is working to onboard facilities to submit ELRs. We also have an EPID form, and there are a few different EPID forms depending on the condition um, that is being reported, and I'll go over that next. But providers would submit an EPID form, and, a, and if, if they need to, a copy of the lab report to the local health department where the case lives. Um, and that is preferred because they are the boots on the ground who are mostly going to be doing the investigations. But it's also possible to send um, to the local to the Kentucky Department for Health the secure facts. Um, and then I did want to mention that alternative mechanisms to report um, for providers to report are also being developed. We are working on direct data entry screens with KHI so that you would be able to go in and basically submit an electronic case report um, by entering data directly onto the screen. But those are still in development. 
So these are the EPID forms. You would use EPID 250 for the healthcare associated infections and multi drug resistant organisms. You use EPID 394 for perinatal hep B and hep C, and then for the EPID 399 for perinatal hep B prevention for infants. There is an adult and a pediatric HIV form, and then you would use the EPID 200 for all other reportable conditions. Okay, and then I just wanted to talk really quickly about submitting isolates and clinical specimens to the Division of Laboratory Services. This is something that we struggle with quite a bit um, from, from some different labs and facilities. So the reason that we ask for this is that DLS and or CDC will perform additional testing on those specimens. Sometimes there are specialized identification testing like for botulism that CDC or the Division of Laboratory Services are really the only ones that offer that kind of testing. Especially when there are new and emerging infections, CDC or the Division of Laboratory Services needs to be able to do confirmatory testing. And then what happens most often is that DLS will need to do additional testing. And that's usually speciation, serotyping, strain typing, or whole genome sequencing. Um, and with whole genome sequencing, they can obtain a lot of different information um, about the organism, including virulence profiles, antimicrobial resistance, and, and all kinds of other information. So, you know, my background is in foodborne and waterborne diseases, so that's the example I'm going to use, but we use that information to link cases across the state and across the country. Um, this has become especially important in the kind of the post-COVID world. Our, our ability to investigate cases was not great before COVID, but since COVID, you know, people really don't want to talk to public health anymore. They're just kind of over us. Um, and so it's very difficult for us to get exposure information from people. You know, they don't want to talk about what they ate. They don't want to talk about their illness. But if we can get their specimen and perform whole genome sequencing, we can link those to other people that maybe would be willing to talk. And then we know that, you know, there's actually an outbreak occurring rather than these sporadic cases. Um, so that's really critical. And if anyone is interested in learning more about that system, um, I included the link for PulseNet. This is the, the laboratory system across the country. Um, every state has a PulseNet lab, some have more than one, and CDC, FDA, and USDA have PulseNet labs. So everyone is sequencing, you know, for example, salmonella isolates and loading them into a centralized database. So this is how, you know, when you hear about CDC investigating an outbreak of salmonella linked to, I don't know, raw chicken from Costco or something. This is how they can do it through PulseNet. Okay, so then I, I think too, it, it helps to know what we do with the information um, that we receive from our medical facilities. I think a lot of times, you know, we, we say that we need this information, but it's unclear why. It just seems like it's going into a black box. Um, and so it's helpful to know what's being done with it. So when public health receives a lab report or an EPID 200 about the form, they are going to start an investigation depending on the condition. Um, some conditions require very robust investigations and contact tracing and um, might even have to implement isolation and quarantine to try to prevent the spread. Others don't require quite in-depth investigation and reporting. But in general, what's gonna happen is that um, the local health department is going to review the medical records available related to that reportable condition. They may interview the case patient using a standardized questionnaire, and that could be a questionnaire that either Kentucky has developed or that CDC requires. Um, if needed, they could conduct follow-up investigations. They This happens particularly when we interview a case patient and then maybe a week or two later, we understand that they're connected to an outbreak and there might be a specialized questionnaire for that outbreak, then we might have to follow up with them and use that questionnaire. We also provide education to them so that they can keep from reinfecting themselves or from infecting others. And then we implement control measures if needed. So for example, again, using foodborne and waterborne, since, since that's my wheelhouse, um, if we had a food worker who had salmonella, we would have to restrict that food worker from returning to work until they had two negative stool cultures, for example. And that's to protect, you know, anyone who would be eating where that person works. So then the other thing that the local health department is going to do 
is they're going to report all their investigation information into NEDS, our National Electronic Disease Surveillance System. All the case information is going to go in there, exposure information, et cetera. We have um, subject matter experts here at the state that will review it and determine whether or not the case meets case definition um, according to CDC, and then we'll assign case status. So if it's a confirmed case, a probable case, or a suspect case, and then that gets reported to CDC. And that this is for every every case. This is what we do. Okay. So a lot of times in public health, we end up with barriers to timely investigations, which means that an investigation is delayed. There's this lag between when a patient is diagnosed with a condition to when public health is actually able to start the investigation on that condition. So a lot of times what happens is that cases are reported with insufficient information to begin a public health investigation. So we might not have a phone number or we might not have an address for that individual. We could be missing the lab report, which we would need to, to start the investigation. And this isn't so much the case anymore, but if it's a handwritten, if it's a handwritten form or if it's a form that's been printed and copied and copied and copied and, and faxed and scanned, it becomes illegible and very difficult to read. Um, and so what happens when this happens is that public health staff have to contact the provider or the laboratory to try to get additional um, documentation. And a lot of times we have to contact them multiple times before the correct documents are sent. And sometimes we also run into a barrier um, where facility staff are not aware of the reportable disease regulation and misinterpret HIPAA and state that, you know, because of HIPAA, they can't send forms. So when delayed investigations happen, there is an impact. So again, if you're, we're talking about foodborne and waterborne diseases, case patient recall decreases rapidly over time. So if you think about what we're really interested in collecting information on, it's going to be if it's salmonella, you know, what someone ate in the five, you know, one to five days before they became ill. And usually when people become ill, they don't seek care immediately. They wait a couple of days and if they don't get better, then they go to the doctor. Then the doctor has to order a stool culture or a PCR and it takes a day or two to get the results back on that. And so by the time the you know, a lab report is generated, a week might have gone by from when the person became exposed to the pathogen. So if you try to think back to what you ate a week to two weeks ago, you could see how how difficult that is to get people, you know, to jog their memory about what they ate. And so then any delay that happens between the lab report and the start of the investigation just pushes that timeline out further. The, the other thing that happens is that, of course, we can't provide that education uh, as timely to the person. So we need to make sure that they understand what they need to do to keep themselves from getting other people sick. Um, again, we may not be able to implement the control measures um, in a timely manner so that food handler might go back to work and keep working while they're infectious. And then it can also lead to a delayed identification of outbreaks, because if we do not have the epi information that we need to connect the cases together and whole genome sequencing, unfortunately, takes quite a bit of time. Um, it, it can take us a while to realize that these are actually connected cases and not just sporadic cases. And again, because of that delay, single cases may grow to outbreaks and small outbreaks may turn into large outbreaks. So that in the end, you have more people becoming infected, hospitalized and potentially dying. Um, and this, of course, it just increases the cost of treatment, hospitalization and lost income. So this is the, the call to action. So report all cases of reportable conditions to your local health department promptly following the regulation. And if possible, you know, fill up, complete the forms as as best you can and make make it legible. Um, and then, like I said, sometimes we need additional information on on the case. So if the local health department calls and asks for additional information, if you can help supply that as quickly as possible, that really helps. And then, of course, educating staff on the reportable disease regulation and HIPAA so that they understand their role in assisting public health with timely investigations. Okay, and then I just really uh, briefly will go over outbreak reporting. So I mentioned this before. 
all outbreaks are reportable in Kentucky, regardless of whether or not the suspected etiology is a reportable condition. So if you've got a GI outbreak or several cases of a GI illness in a long-term care facility, even if you don't have a def definite etiology, that would be a reportable um, outbreak. And again, norovirus is kind of the classic example. The regulation defines the outbreak as two or more cases of a similar illness, including healthcare associated infections that are epi linked or connected by person, place, or time, or a single case of an HAI not commonly diagnosed. And it requires that the same diagnosis or signs and symptoms suggestive of the same illness be there and a clear association between cases with or without a recognized common source. So, for example, residing and working at or visiting the same long-term care facility. I will say that some conditions do have slightly different definitions of outbreak. I believe that for flu, um, flu or COVID might have a different one. It might be three people, um, but the regulation defines it as two. So as far as case and outbreak investigation go, we are considered a shared governance home rule state, which means that local and health district health departments have ultimate jurisdiction over the reportable diseases and outbreaks in their counties. And in Kentucky, we have 120 counties that are covered by 61 county and district health departments. And this map shows our makeup of our health departments. The counties that are all of the same color are in districts, and then the white counties are our independent county health departments. We have 16 regional epidemiologists who are responsible for coordinating case and outbreak investigations in their region. As I mentioned, for the most part, local health department staff and regional epidemiologists investigate the reportable conditions. The exception is that at the within my section in reportable diseases, we do have a centralized interview team and they interview our foodborne and waterborne and enteric diseases, as well as Lyme disease and spotted fever rickettsiosis. That is not for all counties, that's just for some counties who have decided to turn over investigations to us. So it's possible that you'll also be hearing from some of our epi-technical assistants at DPH. Outbreaks are always led by the local health departments, but we do provide assistance and guidance. And this is our map of our regional epidemiologists. Um, you can see that they cover 16 different, re well, 14 regions, and then Fayette County and Jefferson County are their own entity. And then I'm not going to go very in detail with outbreak investigations, but um, did just want to mention that there are many steps to an outbreak investigation that the local health department and the regional epi will undertake. So the first step would be to confirm the existence of an outbreak. So we think something's going on. They're going to investigate a little bit and decide whether or not this truly is potentially an outbreak. They're going to conduct a full epi investigation. If they do, this would involve, you know, reviewing medical records, interviewing cases, maybe interviewing um, well companions. There'll be a laboratory investigation with testing of clinical specimens an environmental investigation um, that could include testing of clinical or environment that couldn't include testing of environmental specimens, possibly food or water, as well as possible environmental assessments. You know, as soon as we identify what's going on, we're going to try to implement control and prevention measures to keep other people from getting sick. There's going to be communication up and down and laterally across all partners. And then we do have final report and final report forms that have to be submitted. And that is my contact information. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, this, this was a great overview. To think of then is, I mean, it, this is a, a very broad review of what, what our responsibilities are um, uh, in terms of supporting this. What are some of the, maybe if you can give us some, we, we need to do better at A, B, and C, or what are the things that you think we, that we really do well in support of this that we need to make sure we continue? Or it's kind of like, you know, how, because this is a, this is an example of continuous improvement, right, uh, all around. So 
uh, what uh, what messages I think uh, you know become most important for us to in support of these activities? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know it. It depends on uh, from facility to facility. Everyone's got their strengths um, and their weaknesses. I think you know in general again making sure that documentation that's sent is legible um, i know that that's hard but hopefully as technology is improving we're relying less and less on facts and handwritten um you know if if pdf fillable forms are available try to fill those out electronically as opposed to handwriting um i know one of the things that we're really trying to do is encrypting sending things in encrypted email more so that we're not relying on handwritten faxes um getting timely specimens to the division of laboratory services is really critical um for some of for some of those conditions and some of the investigations and i think where possible fill forms out as completely as possible so we we really need patient phone numbers so that we can do investigations and we really are trying to improve our understanding of race and ethnicity for our cases so that we can really get a grasp on on the health disparities that are occurring in the state. So as you know, as we really recognize that what, what you're saying that sometimes there is the maybe the thought that um, that public health reporting is optional, and it's not optional. That you know our job is to figure out how we get it done in a way, and it's not only reporting but it's getting feedback regarding what we need to do, um, and so. You know, it may be helpful and it would be great to get some comments from from um, other folks that are on the, the call. If we were to try to work on putting together kind of a, you know, what does a new infection preventionist need to know regarding their responsibilities or what they need to do for, you know, for uh, notifiable diseases to kind of show how broad that is. That might be something that would be helpful. There may be some um, uh, on the call that are saying, yeah, I wish I'd had that, or maybe they've already developed something. But I think that almost like a cheat sheet of what do you need to do? Now we, we can still get, a, you know, get the list of the reportable diseases and probably everybody has, you know, a bunch of those posted all over the place. So just so they remember, but it's things like not only do I need to have the list, but, but my laboratory needs to know so that there is someone in the, in the lab and that my provider, especially on the outpatient side, you know, need to know what our responsibilities are with reporting. But if you have any comments on, you know, how we might even begin to approach that, or maybe if there is already something like that, that we can work on sharing with new IPs. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I, I can't think of a cheat sheet. Um... But I think that that is something that we could definitely work on. Yeah. Other than other than the amended table, that's probably about the only thing we have. Yeah. Are there any? I want to check and always make sure if there are questions or comments in the in the chat. Let me let me know so I, I can convey those on. It doesn't doesn't look like that. Dr. Mears, I know you always, from the provider perspective, I know you always have a unique perspective um, about this and like, you know, I, how, how does all this work in from the provider? I have a, um, a, a question or a comment or a question. Um, uh, considering that, that, that most of the recent pandemics and future pandemics are going to be probably still a respiratory infection, we have you no know, H1N1, the, the COVID-19, and these are, uh, we assume there's going to be new emerging viruses uh, and, and usually it's going to be, as happened with COVID-19, some form of uh, acute respiratory illness. Um, do, do we see the, the, the possibility uh, in the future of, of having some form of, of surveillance or, or requirement of, of defining uh, what is the what is the level of of acute respiratory infections in the community that if we see an spike that then we can proactively go and try to to investigate uh, assuming that that the problems are always or re, or is going to be probably most likely respiratory viruses or or even even um, a, a connection of 
I mean, we've been discussing this in some meetings. I remember that, that um, uh, my area of, of interest in research is pneumonia, I'm going to meetings on pneumonia. There's always this idea, why is pneumonia in no country around the world is a reportable disease when, when, when a lot of problems originated as pneumonia. And then after several cases, we figure out, okay, we have a new pathogen here that we need to, to recognize. Do you see something of this coming in the future or, or do you see the, the possibility of um, all the you know, hospitals connected directly to, to the health department and having a report and an actual real life report of what is going on with respiratory infections in the, in the community? Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. So we, we do look at syndromic surveillance data for the state and that is, uh, we use syndromic surveillance for a lot of um, conditions, but what we really use it for are is influenza like illness and COVID like illness right now. Um, and so that is, we, it's kind of complicated to explain. Our Kentucky Health Information Exchange is linked to most hospitals in the state and they receive admission discharge and transfer data so that's atd data from the these facilities and so we have a syndromic surveillance coordinator who does look at our ili and cli data and he he will send out reports to the local health departments when something is being triggered for their region or their county um the I think the next step that we have to do as public health that that we're working on is figuring out what we do with that data, you know, so the system identifies that Rowan County is having, you know, high ILI reported from from their local facilities. So, so then the, I think the next step is so what is public health supposed to do with that information or what are providers supposed to do. And so I think that's, that's a great point. That's what we need to figure out, you know, what are our next steps when when we do see those um, increases as far as pneumonia goes um i i agree that more needs to be done i think part of the challenge with pneumonia is that so many different bugs can cause pneumonia and so often when people are diagnosed with that with pneumonia they they don't necessarily have testing done um and so kind of an, a good example of that is is legionella you know we end up with a, when we have outbreaks of legionella we end up with a lot of suspect cases because they're epi linked somehow and they are clinically compatible for pneumonia, but no one ever did Legionella testing on them. So we can't really say for certain that they had Legionella, but given that they were epi linked and clinically compatible, probably. Um, so I, I think some of the challenges with, with some of those syndromes like pneumonia, where you have multiple different etiologies that can cause them, I, I think that makes it, um, a little difficult to do kind of lab-based surveillance, which is typically what public health relies on. But very good points. Um, and I do think too, you know, the, the this past year um, with the levels of RSV, it's really shown that we, we do need to be able to look at what is going on that's not reportable as well, um, as far as syndromic surveillance. I, I think that some of the challenges when you have multiple circulating respiratory viruses, um, teasing those apart or for really understanding what's going on can be difficult. Yeah, the, the, I, I agree. The challenge with the clinical practice that we discussed this with, with microbiology is that, that for an individual patient, probably see most of the patients are going to do fine with empiric antibiotic therapy, then nobody wants to spend the time, the energy or the money trying to to define what is the theology of the pneumonia. But, but from a public health perspective, it's so important to define what type of etiology is the cause of the pneumonia. Then, uh, you know, I wonder if she, ever should have a, a percentage of the pneumonia cases that you really need to investigate to report to, to public health, okay, what is going on with your pneumonia? Because otherwise, uh, we have, Clinically, people don't tend to test, uh, and then we miss the opportunity to get to, to know, and we may miss the opportunity for some important uh, new pathogen emerging.
All right, you're great. Any any last uh, comments from anyone? I know we'll everybody's probably uh, ready to run back and check and see how many things they need to go report. Back to you, Carol. So, <laughs> well, thanks uh, to everyone again. Um, if you have questions, you can always send them to us or uh, send them directly to Carol about today's topic. But it was uh, good again to see everybody as we get started again in 2023. And I think Dave added the topic for next week. We'll be having a, a primer on germicides. We've had lots of questions about different germicides and what we're seeing on the market and you know what should we be using or not using. So we'll have a, a primer and update on those. And it was good to see everyone. We will see you back uh, next Wednesday then, same, same time. Thank you very much. It was excellent presentation. Thank you.